on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This the people party Peace and love, party people. How you feeling? This is Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. Welcome to another wonderful, fantastic, totally entertaining edition of the world's best podcast, The People's Party. And as normal and as usual, I have my lovely and talented and intelligent and funny co-host, the best co-host in the podcast game. Give it up for Jasmine Lee in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? Oh, that's me. Everyone's not clapping. I don't see you clapping. All right. Jasmine. What's up, Tyler? Jasmine, what's up? I'm doing good. And you know, I'm always excited when we have one of my tribe. That's right. Whatever you call it. Fellow comedian. On. Yes. In the place to be. Yes. Yeah, we're doing comedy things today on the People's Party. That's right. Well, today we have one of the most prolific comedians working i mean this man is literally everywhere and if he's not there yet he's coming there soon yes um he is the creator of several specials you can see on netflix completely normal mostly stories disgraceful and the most recent one ball hog he's got two stand-up albums from earlier in his career thrilled and this album has one of the best album titles i've ever heard in my life uh white girls with cornrows um <laughs> you can catch him as the host of three podcasts, he's a podcast fucking beast. You got your mom's house with his wife, Christina Pazinski. Uh, Pasitsky, did I say that right? Pretty close. Okay. Christina P. That's what she is. There we go. Yep. Uh, two Bears, One Cave with fellow comedian Bert Kreischer Love and him. as well as the new Tom Talks podcast, which I was on and it was a good time. Yes. A uh, fantastic comedian. I've seen this man work. I met him in Vegas recently. And I had heard his name, but when he stepped on that stage, those people went crazy. So I was like, I got to invest time in, in paying attention to this man's art. A new friend, please welcome Mr. Ladybug himself, <laughs> Tom Segura in the place to be. Thank, Thank you very Tom. much. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. How you feeling, Tom? I'm feeling good, man. I'm feeling good because I'm drinking now, too. So. Oh, okay. Cheers. Um, Thanks. I'm going to get a drink in a second. He's Don't um, break any more out. limbs. Hey, I'll try not to. All right. <laughs> yeah, so let's get into that, Tom, yeah. because my friend uh jenna showed me a video yeah of, <laughs> of how this happened well this is like so so people think that they're like i got injured in december right right and then i i, I sported this thing the last couple of weeks people were like did you fucking do something again <laughs> right. and i'm like no right. i didn't do anything crazy again what happened was i broke my arm uh -huh. and my patellar tendon attempting to dunk <laughs> right. on a nine foot three hoop okay and then they immediately they did surgery within a couple of days. I have, right. you know, titanium plates and screws in here. Okay. And I was like, function like, you know, when we did the shows in Vegas, mm -hmm. like, you know, I was just walking on stage and holding the mic. Everything was fine. Yeah. And you were but in pain. I was not I was like I was not feeling pain. But what happened was like they told me that a nerve mm -hmm. wasn't healing right. Cause I, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't like extend on my left hand my the like three fingers all the way. Mm -hmm. And basically they go, You can see if it heals on its own. And I was like or what? And they're like, it might not. <laughs> and then after a while, they go, or we could do a nerve transfer where they actually take a nerve out of one part of your arm and move it to another part of your arm, and it steals juice, like power. Wow. wow. And it's and I was like, how long have you been doing that surgery? <laughs> and they were like, a year. And I oh, was that's like, some new shit. There's some new shit. Okay, let's do it. So they did it. And okay. uh, that's why I'm wrapped up in this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I saw the video, and it looks like your self tape for white man can't jump too. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. <laughs> it looks uh, like you were sliding into first base, dude. It's it's the <laughs> worst. It's hilarious. It, it was it, uh, luckily I was able to monetize it. <laughs> Good, thank God. So. Good, and I'm glad you're feeling better, and yeah. I'm glad that they're doing uh, Bionic Man technology on your arm. I'm going to have some really wild scars <laughs> yeah. on Friday when they take well, this off. Scars are just tell your story. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was. Porkopolis. Yep. <laughs> the middle of it all. <laughs> the middle of it all. You can man. tell I've been. Yeah. Oh, you've been. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, we, we, we cleared that up. Yeah. Tom, um, earlier I did Tom's show and um, he brought up a rumor about me and high tech that I thought only record industry people and Jared knew. <laughs> And it's crazy, and you know you have to go listen to Tom's show to hear about that. But Jared is actually my partner in People's Party. Yeah, and um, he's gonna enjoy hearing that story. That was great, man. Yeah. I loved. I, I mean, I loved getting to ask you those things. You know, it's something yeah. I've. I mean, I've held heard that thing and held on to it for I don't okay. know, like fifteen years or something, man. Okay. So it was so fun to ask you about it. Yeah, man. I've spent a lot of time in Ohio, not just 
in Cincinnati when I used to work with High Tech and everybody else I work with out there, but also in Yellow Springs with Dave Chappelle. Yeah. So I've, I feel like I've gotten to know Ohio a little bit more than most people. Um, tell me what Ohio adds to who you are as a person. I mean, you know, to me, so we moved a lot. You know, I, I, as a kid, I, moved, I lived in a lot of different places. So to me, Ohio, it's my birthplace, mm -hmm. but it's mostly like it's childhood memory. It's, it's more like backyards because mm -hmm. we left when I was nine. So a lot of times when you become, you know, when you're an adult, people know where you're, where you're from. They'll be like, oh, and they'll start asking you about certain places in, mm -hmm. let's say, Cincinnati. And I'm like, yeah, I never drove there, man. Right. Like, I, I went to this creek, right. and uh, we played in the yard. Like, right. those are my memories of Cincinnati right. and of Ohio. It's family, you know, childhood friends, and and just playing, basically. Right. You know, it was like we left in third grade. I was okay. in third grade. So it's still it's still a hometown, obviously, yeah. and I still have family there. Right. But, still um, have connections there. Still have connections there, and I still tour. I always go on tour there, and it's, it's always really good to me. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, I don't have, like, those adult references mm -hmm. for Cincinnati, you know? That Skyline Chili, man. Like Skyline that's, Chili, That's yeah. it. Um, you were born to a Peruvian mother and a Spanish and Cajun father. For those who don't know, Cajun just became recognized in 1980, I believe. Um, as, how, a, as, a, as an ethnic group? Yeah, in 80, 1980. 1980. Yeah, okay. it's, very, it's very new. Because um, <laughs> when I saw that, I looked it up because I was like, I didn't know Cajun was it, but I, I looked it up and, you know, it was legit. So <laughs> it's cool. Uh, <laughs> how did growing up with immigrant parents inform your comedy and were there times growing up that you felt marginalized or were you always um, perceived as white? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I always felt like I used to spend a lot of time in Peru as a kid. Mm -hmm. So in my summers, I would go to Peru. Mm -hmm. And basically what, what would happen is that in Peru, I was definitely a Yankee, to them, like a white American to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you're, uh, and my mother is, you know, like olive skin, has a head, she came over when she was like 31, so she has a heavy accent. So when you're a kid and like you're in school, people find out your mother's an immigrant and stuff, you, they perceive, like you would perceive you a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. So like basically in school, you know, I would get sometimes teased and taunted about my mother mm -hmm. and her accent and the way she speaks and, you know, all the jokes to me, they'd be like, yeah, he's white, but he's a spick. You know, like that, mm -hmm. that's what everybody would call me. And like, even if affectionately. Right. Uh, and then when I would go down to Peru, they'd be like, you're oh, an American and you're mm -hmm. white. Like you're super white, you know. <laughs> and because I, I have my dad's, you know. Skin tone. Skin tone. And, kind of, and then my sisters, like, if we go out in the, in the sun, my sisters get brown and I get pink. Oh, so wow. it's just like, it's, you know, the way, just genetics, like right. the way it works. But to answer your question about comedy, like, my mom is the like the funniest person I know, like right. legit an amazing intuitive storyteller. So like if you go out and we all went to like a, a restaurant for lunch or whatever, and you ask her what happened, it's always an entertaining and it's full of details, which is what you learn in comedy is what makes something a story funny. It's mm -hmm. the details. It's like. The guy was there and his eye looked like he did drugs all day long. You know, like she always adds like color to stories. You know, mm -hmm. you wait 10 minutes in line. She'll say like, we were in line three hours. So you learn like <laughs> exaggeration. Like she's a natural comedic storyteller. Right. And the, like so, so funny. And my dad is not. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's just a complete opposite. Right. But she is man. like a natural comedian, natural right. comedian. Um, when I met you, the night I met you in Vegas, uh, Cypher Sounds came up to you yeah. with this rumor. Yeah, this <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, and the rumor, correct me if I'm wrong, the rumor was that you somehow went to Netflix to do something and they were like, well, we need more diversity. You're like, I'm Latino. Yeah, I was like, what? And he goes, this is what people are talking about. And I was like, what are you talking about? And the only thing I didn't get to tell him about this was like, I pitched them a show uh -huh. that they offered to buy uh -huh. about my family. Right. So and they offered and it was a uh, my dad's a white Vietnam vet American and my mom's Peruvian mm -hmm. and like is a like you're crazy Latina right. and I mean that was in the pitch right. but I wasn't like what are you talking about like <laughs> your reaction to it was hilarious I was like what and he was like this is what people are talking right. about right he came to you as yeah. a representative from and the I was like history. pero yo no sé lo que dice <laughs> like I'm <laughs> like right. don't even speak English or something I was like right. all right man I don't know now you had a plan to shoot a uh, special all in Spanish right yeah so 
they offered Netflix offered me a, to shoot. We we came to them with the idea of doing it, and they they loved it. Mm-hmm. And now, by the way, they're like, we're not going to pay you English rates. <laughs> I was what? like, uh, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. I was like all excited. Like, I get another special, and they're like, no, 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 no. no. Um, you get catering, and that's kind they of. They told it. you no in Spanish. Too. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, so initially, the plan was. To, I think we pitched them the idea in late 2019, mm-hmm. and they offered to, to to do it. And it was like, start touring in 2020 and maybe shoot it at the end of 2020. Uh, and we all know what happened to 2020. Yeah, right. So then they kicked it to this year. And this year didn't get off to the best start. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I'm not going to like run this set 15 times and right. shoot a special. Right. Right. So, But then they came to me and said, they're like, you can shoot it whenever you want. So I was like, all right, I'll just keep. So I've been touring on and off in uh, doing Spanish shows too. Okay. So I did a Texas run. I just did um, uh, on Ontario, California and Brea and, and like, you know, it's really fun. I have to work so much harder, which is like kind of the exciting part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, not that you don't have to work hard in English to make stand up or comedy mm-hmm. work. You do, you have to, mm-hmm. you have to bust your ass. Mm-hmm. But when you're doing jokes to an audience in your second language, you know, you have to be that much more dialed in, like super focused. Mm-hmm. And then you have to really, when the sets end, I sit there with the other like native speaking, Spanish speaking mm-hmm. comics and go over like, what was it about this that didn't work? What mm-hmm. what worked with this? And you really, really have to pay attention. I can't wow. even imagine how difficult that must be. I, but I, I'd want to see it. And I know that I would not understand large portions of it, but I'd want to see it just to see the timing. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and you'll, the funny thing is you'll pick up on... You'd, you'd pick up on the cadence and, like, the punchline coming. You'd be like, oh, here, it's coming here. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, but even if you don't understand it, you would know this This is a, this is the joke. Yeah. You would get where the joke is. Yeah. But it's it's so it's so much more focus. Mm. Like, it, it takes just an incredible amount of focus for me to do it. I watch a lot of telenovelas, so I know Spanish, kind uh-huh. of. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> at 18, you overdosed on GHB and fell into a coma, uh-huh. which, for those who don't know, is a date rape drug, <laughs> and it creates euphoria, much like ecstasy, but also brings a depressing effect um, and can lead to blackouts. How much have you shared about that experience, and did it shift your relationship with drugs and alcohol? Definitely. Um, I, you know, I've, I didn't really talk about it for a long time. I don't think I've actually ever really dealt with it that much Mm -hmm. like it was such a traumatic like traumatic experience when it happened so but here's like what happened i'm a freshman in college Mm -hmm. and thanksgiving weekend is like that first weekend especially for freshmen where you go back to your hometown and you often see everybody that you were in high school with right Mm -hmm. and somebody had a house party Mm -hmm. and i go there and this guy had always had drugs and i was like i want to get ghb because i had gotten into it as a senior in high school, and he was always the supplier. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I'll have some later. I just have, like, Molly right now. So I, I took it. And I and that was the first time I had done that. In a few and minutes, what I'll, year was this? 97. I didn't know Molly was that old. Uh, oh, yeah, it's old. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You came in on a tail end. Yeah. I did, I did. <laughs> yeah, so. You missed all the fun. I guess, you know, <laughs> we weren't calling it that then, right? But, but anyways, they, like I take it, and like within a few minutes, I was like, "Hey, I don't feel anything." He was like, "Give it a fucking minute, man." Right. Like because GHB was like immediate, you know, it was it was liquid, and it tasted like ocean water, and immediately you felt it through your body, and you were just like in a euphoric state, wow. you know. So I I keep hounding him, and the party goes from his house to a bar, so we all go to the bar. Meanwhile, the whole time, like when I'm at his house and, and get to the bar, I'm drinking. And one thing they always told you if you don't mix it, you don't, they're like, it's fatal. And, you know, I'm a freshman and I don't give, I'm just drinking, drinking, drinking. Well, I finally hit him up like an hour later at this bar and I go, can I get some GHB? And he goes, yeah, meet me in my car. So I go to his car mm-hmm. and it had always been dispensed in a water, they give you a water bottle, right? That's how they would sell it to you. Mm-hmm. And a, a dose was a cap. So imagine how little that liquid is. A water bottle cap is mm-hmm. what you would take. Mm-hmm. He hands me a gallon milk jug because he hasn't broken it down into the water bottles yet. This is like his, yeah, his big stash. Yeah. So I I take it and I'm like, you know, a gal a gallon milk jug weighs more, and I'm like, well, I can't pour it into 
a milk jug cap. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I going to? So I put it up to my mouth and I pour it in and I put it and I realize that like my mouth is full. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be rude. So you got to swallow it. Spit it out. I I just swallow it. And it it takes me a second to register that like, I think I just took like 10 hits of this shit. No. Right? Right? And I just put it down and I'm like, cool, man. I get out of the car and I'm like flying. And my, meanwhile, I've had, you know, 10, 12 drinks. Mm-hmm. And I'm just walking through this bar like, what's up, man? Like just hitting people up. And they're like, you're in a good mood, dude. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm fucking Shit. out of my mind. And then I go to the patio of this bar. And I remember that the girlfriend, the girl I was dating at the time, sat on my lap. And that's all I, rem- I, I passed out. And what I learned later was that people were like, just let them sleep it off. But my older sister was at the bar. Oh. And she called 911. I was your I, angel for that night. Yep. I had a similar experience. The first time I took ecstasy, mm-hmm. I did too, did not listen to the rules, and I was drinking and doing ecstasy, and I passed out in, in the club. And then I woke up outside. I tried to get back in. The bouncer was like, no, you're a liability. Wait, you tried to get back in? I tried to get back in. After Do you falling. remember trying to get back in? I remember trying to get back in. And then I passed out again. They put me into a truck. And the next thing I know, I woke up naked with like... 10 of my friends over me in the bathtub, like pouring, like they had me in the shower. Like Jesus. Just, exactly. And then I got cursed out by so many people the next day, but it was not a fun experience. And wait, because you had, like, did it change your relationship? It did not. It did not. Okay. It, it did not. See, but, mine, mine did. Mine was so scared because I woke up in a hospital with like intubated tubes, tubes everything, you know? And when you get out of there, Everyone's like, you're a drug addict. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I didn't think I was. It was you a know? mistake. I, thought I just partied too hard one night. But it was so it was so scary to have that happen that that was, ba- that was the last time I ever did any hard drug. Like, mm-hmm. since that day, I didn't... I, don't, I didn't touch anything for like a year. Mm-hmm. And then since then, it was it's just mm-hmm. weed or alcohol, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you haven't learned your lesson yet. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Right. I only passed out once. The other time uh, I was responsible with my drugs, I okay, drank okay. water like I was supposed she's to. Like, good I, call. It, good call. She's like, if I don't go to the hospital. Yeah, you know, I'm good. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, that's that's not a good metric, but we shall move on. I'm a mother now. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Don't call CPS. <laughs> okay. But go on. Don't call CPS. That's got to be the name of your special. It is. But <laughs> um, shameless plug. <laughs> you said on your show with me that you estimated that 90% of the music that you've listened to is hip hop. Yeah. You're a big fan of hip hop. Yeah. From an early age, mm-hmm. I remember just, you know, music hits you, like music is in, involuntarily subjective, meaning like, you know, you don't, it's not like you're necessarily even, I feel like you're not even picking what you like. Mm-hmm. It just happens, you know? Yeah. So it was like, it was like Fat Boys and, and Run DMC at first. And then like, as I got older, it was Tribe and De La and, uh, and Wu-Tang. And then, I mean, I was turning what 12 13 and 92 93 Mm -hmm. so like it's like the craziest years of releases i mean you had like cypress hill and nas and all the like all these uh biggie all all coming out in these like these two and three year periods so it felt like it was that was the music you were like supposed to listen to Mm -hmm. i I didn't even understand when someone was like i don't really listen to hip-hop i was like what the fuck are you listening (laughs) to like and then it became a thing where you wanted to like separate yourself from the casual fan, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Mm -hmm. because hip hop became more commercially popular. Yeah. And you wanted to be like, like, I, like, I I loved that feeling Mm -hmm. of picking up, you know, an album and putting it in. Someone's like, how do you, how did you know about this? Right. And the answer really is, it's not that I had like, you know, crazy, it's it's just that you're curious Mm -hmm. that you're like, I've, I've already liked this genre of music. So I keep checking stuff out. You, you know. are a conscious curator. Yeah. 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 It hit me like I didn't even really start listening to music outside of hip hop, but honestly, until like in my 30s. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, which is like kind of rare because usually at, by that time you're like, well, I'm definitely just married to what I've been listening to, which I am. Right. But it's just been that thing where like I just, I love, I love beats. Like I love, you know, it, it takes mm-hmm. me a while to sometimes to even dial in on lyrics because sometimes lyrics sound like music to me Mm -hmm. like to my ear it sounds like another instrument it's that backflip flow that's what that is (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
when you were um, interviewing um, Christian Han, it was yeah. what you're saying now makes that interview more interesting to me because your fascination with how the beats are made and Love learning it. about the samples and you you saying how y'all both were talking about how you hear a song and you're like, I didn't even know I like this type of music, but hip hop brought me to this. Yes. It's very interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it, and and he, you know, is, is it's so, he's so great at what he does where he he will break down, he breaks down all types of music, but in hip hop, it's great because he'll break down, like we were going over a song. Uh, Beastie Boy song. No, no. Well, yeah, he and I were, but you and I were going over a song. We were trying to figure out who, what it was sampling, one of yours, right? And then yeah. we got the name the name wrong, and then we figured it out. Yeah. But like when, when Christian was doing Shout that. Shout out to Ben Queller. There you go. <laughs> when, uh, when Christian was doing that, it's like he then is like, oh, you, didn't, you might not have even known about this like. R and B song or mm -hmm. soul song from the from the seventies, mm -hmm. and and that's what they sampled. Like I I love there's a there's a station that I I'm not remembering now that all they play I think it's a Spotify station, mm -hmm. all they play are songs that have been sampled mm -hmm. in hip hop songs. So when it comes on, you're like oh, mm -hmm. and then you realize that it's the like the song that was sampled. Right. I love it. Yeah, man. Um, one of the reasons I became good friends with Dave Chappelle is because he used to come over to my house in Brooklyn and. I don't know if I could do it now because hip hop, this was 20 years, it was 20 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. So hip hop is a lot more prolific since then. But there was a time when I knew everything about hip hop to the point right. where I knew every sample for every song. Really? Yeah. Like I, like I would hear, I would just be like, that's from that and that's from that. And like me and my friends would sit around and we'd have, we'd have tapes, cassettes or CDs just of DJs mixing samples. Yeah. And that was something that we would do in the crib. Just listen to that. That's that song. That's that song. That's that's and Dave tells that story all the time. Like I don't understand how they were doing that. Yeah, it's um, amazing yeah. to me. It was a humbling experience to hang out with somebody like Russell Peters. Mm -hmm. My birthday so, twin. Yeah. 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 Russ, so Russell's a good friend of mine. Right. And when I met him, I met him on the and road. He's an excellent uh ambassador for hip hop. He really on the planet. is. He yeah. really is. Yeah. And my old thing was like, Yeah, I love hip hop. He's like, Oh, you do? And then we're we're in the car and we're talking about it. And then hearing his level of knowledge, I was like, oh, maybe I don't like him. <laughs> like, because he was talking about like who played drums on the, and like he would talk, he knew like the engineer of songs. Wow. And I was like, all right, man. Like I, I thought I liked it, but right. you're at a totally different level. Well, when you were at uh, Lenore Ryan, is yeah, that how I say it? that's how you say it. Yeah. Lenore Ryan, yeah. um, you were a college DJ. Yeah. I mean, I so I first, I was in the communications program. It's a really small school and they had a radio station. Mm -hmm. So I went in there and I was like, well, I was just trying to figure out like what what to do with, at, at this mm -hmm. school and what to pursue. And I was like, oh, I want to be, I wanted to be on a mic, mm -hmm. but also I was like, oh, I can play music. And I, you know, I didn't know like this little radio station had, had relationships with labels. Yeah. So then we would go there and, and you'd be there, uh, be there to open these packages that would come in from the different radio stations. And then I, because I love hip hop, I would reach out. Mm -hmm. Because the, the the you know different people working there would reach out only to certain labels because the music right. they liked. Right. But then I would you know be in contact with Tommy Boy and Def Jam and and get the get the albums from them and eventually I became the uh, radio station manager. Mm -hmm. So then I made made it mandatory to get lots of hip hop. Hip -hop. There. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Um, after college, you were hitting comedy clubs <clears throat> at night, but your day job consisted of writing transcripts for reality shows like Extreme Makeover yeah. and My Big Fat Obnoxious Boss. Yeah. Which side note is fucking amazing it's because most comedians' day jobs uh, nowhere near that cool. Working at McDonald's <laughs> or you yeah. know, no job at all, homeless. What encouragement and advice do you have for people who are doing menial labor or simple jobs while they trace, chase their dreams? Well, I think my advice would be you'll find out if you're obsessed or not. And if you're not, that's okay, but this Good is job. probably not going to work out. <laughs> because, you know, I, I talk to a lot of young comedians especially, and looking back at that time, because, you know, you remember like your group you started with. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you remember like people dropping out. Sometimes they drop out after year one. Sometimes it's year seven. Sometimes it's year 12. But the real thing that like for, for my group that I started with, that I'm in year 19 now, you go, well, all of us 
like had an, a level of obsession mm-hmm. that you can't coach. Yes. You, I can't make you not care that you're poor. Mm. I can't make you not care. You know, I can't make you not care that that um, your friends are going on vacation and buying homes and talking about retirement accounts at 28. Mm. And you're like, what? I mean, what? like, yeah, dude, that doesn't happen for us, at least for most of us, till later. That's so true. You know, so like you have to you have to love stand up more than you love basically yes. everything else. Yes. That's right. I've been doing comedy for six years, and I I I I, I thought I loved stand up, but I really realized I love stand up. Just recently, I was in New York, and I had a spot at a comedy club, and they told I I didn't have a babysitter, and they told me the baby couldn't come in the bar, and so I was willing to sit in the rain with my baby outside of the club and wait until it was my turn and then run in through the rain and go do my set. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, there's no way that I'm not gonna make it. Like, there's no fucking way. So I wanna tell you my- You're obsessed. My version of that story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because (laughs) I was with her, she came to my show and my show, we ended at like, what, one o'clock in the morning. Uh And then she saw some friends of hers she knew from LA and she had her baby with her. She's like, I'm gonna go to the comedy club. And in my mind, I was like, that's a terrible idea. (laughs) You need to take that baby home. Yeah. But she's a grown woman, so I didn't feel like it was my place to say this. Sure. So I did it, right? So now she goes to the club. Mm -hmm. The guy who runs that club is my barber, right? And my barber who had cut my hair earlier that day at my house, and she was there. So she comes back and tells me, yeah, your barber, he didn't want to let me in at first with with my baby. And I was like, he sounds like a very decent human being. (laughs) That sounds like exactly what he yeah. was supposed to do. Right. She was like, but then he ended up letting me in. I was like, okay, so sounds like an even better guy. Yeah, yeah. And then so he came, I was, he came to cut my hair again. He was like, yeah, I seen your friend. She had a baby with her. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, she had a baby with her. I was like, I heard. I said, I am so sorry. What did you do? You just locked the baby up in the car? Wait, no, she came in. No, oh. no, no. It, she came in. She, she came she, in. She, she came she, in. She, she's a rider. Yeah. It's and like, she laughs for me too and claps. So there you my, go. My, I mean, my biggest fan. It's like th- those are the stories where like you'll be telling that story in another ten years and people are oh, like, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Right. You waited it's in the rain and like, mm-hmm. yeah, dude. Like we waited in the rain. I had shitty jobs. I lived in a shitty apartment in a shitty neighborhood where people fucking got killed outside. Like it wasn't a good setup. When you were twenty three, doing these clubs, you met your wife Christina Patsitsky. I'm gonna. Is that right? So. I think the way we're supposed to say it okay, okay. is uh, Pajitsky. Pajitsky. Yes. I want to get it right because my name is the type of name that people fuck Right. Up. But she goes by Christina P now. Christina P. Yeah. Just she's a rapper. That's what's up. Yeah. <laughs> she actually has a single out. <laughs> <laughs> she does. Um, tell us about that relationship, how you met, and how you started doing the, your mom's house, which is a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy. Um, so I met her. There was a place on... Um, on Sunset called the Cat Club. Mm-hmm. It was owned by a guy from, I forget the band, like a like an 80s rock mm-hmm. group. And he had his, had this little- That sounds familiar to Yeah, me. this little bar uh, club, you know, and they had, mm-hmm. a, it had a stage. I mean, we're talking like a 50 seat kind of place. Mm-hmm. I actually um, lied the first time that I got booked. Mm-hmm. I had a, I told a friend that I wanted to try it and he introduced me to the lady that booked it. He's like, oh, he's a comic. And she was like, oh, you want to do a show in like two weeks? And I was like, sure. Right. And I had never done it. Wow. But I got hooked, you know, like you just get hooked. Right. So after doing that a few times, I see her outside of that place. And we just, I met her, we just became, we were just friends, Mm -hmm. you know, like I I hung out. uh, She was dating another guy who wasn't a comic Mm -hmm. and I was friendly with him. And and I just treated her like, you're one of the comics, you know, like just Mm -hmm. normal. And, and we, did I don't know dozens of shows like in that group, kind of like mm-hmm. that uh, that group you start with, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a few years later, uh, one of her friends told me she's he was like, oh, you know, she's single now. And I was like, what's up? And I right. just swooped in there. <laughs> and then a few years after that, I uh, I remember I remember like 2009 mm-hmm. that Joe Rogan had called me and I was opening for him. He had, I was opening for him like semi-regularly, you know, mm-hmm. every other month or something. And he goes, come over to my house. We're going to do a podcast. And I was like, what, do you, what is that? Right. And we sat on a couch mm-hmm. in his home office and he kept telling me to sit forward because I kept like, <laughs> he was like, sit up, man, talk in the mic. And I was like, all right. And I, did, I had no idea what we were talking right. about. And I had no idea what we had just done. 
Um, it would go up on his, I think on his website. Mm-hmm. And he had a message board on his website. Mm-hmm. So people were, and I was, I walked out, I was like, what was that? And he's like, oh, people are listening. And you could see that they're talking about the mm-hmm. things we talked about. I totally dismissed it. Mm-hmm. And like, he kept telling me, he goes, you should start a podcast. You should start a podcast. And this is like now getting into 2010. At this point, his is like, you know, starting mm-hmm. to gain traction. And, and then one day in like late 2010, I want to say like August, September, 2010, he calls me and he goes, dude, I was at the improv last night. I saw your wife get on stage. She's hilarious. Mm-hmm. And I go, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he goes, how are you not doing a podcast together? This mm. is stupid. Wow. So I was like, all right. And I, cause I was totally reluctant to do it. I didn't right. want to do it. So I, I, I asked her, I go, you want to do it? And she was like, I guess like that. Like mm-hmm. if you want to, mm-hmm. I had no idea what it would be, we go over to Brian Redband's apartment. Redband! Yeah, in, in Burbank. Him. And he does, he produces the first 40 episodes for us. And those go up on his Death Squad um, label. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, I go, I think I can produce this on my own. Mm-hmm. So I take it over and start producing it out of an apartment. And basically, it has just, we've never wavered from doing it. Wow. So it's been, this is year the 11. consistency helps. Absolutely. And yeah. I tell every young podcaster, they're like, what should I do? I go, well, at this point, look, this is a, there's obviously a lot of podcasts now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, it's an outrageous amount. So I always say, you know, try to, try to like separate yourself in some way, like, you know, distinguish what the show, the mm-hmm. content, whatever it is. You can study the landscape of what's working mm-hmm. and see that, you know, like there's, this is a podcast about murders. Look at the yeah. fan base for like, like think in terms of that if you can. And then release it on the same day every week. Right. How long, how many years were you in before you realized the consistency was working in your benefit? Well, that's interesting because at, at first I was doing the things that a lot of young podcasters do where I'd be like, well, you know, we're busy this week. Right. Mm-hmm. We'll do it again next week or, you know, doing it like that. And then I think it was that we had been doing it for a while, meaning like a year or two. And I think we missed a week. Mm -hmm. And I saw all these messages like on Twitter. Because I I was also like figuring out like, oh, these are a lot of people listening. It's like starting to get like bombarded with messages, especially if we did a bit Mm. and the bit worked. You'd see like a thousand people hit you up about the bit. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that's just the people that are messaging me. Right. Somebody had said to me, and I wish I remembered who it was, that at that time and even now, it's like, TV when we were kids, like when we were sitcoms, where they go, this show comes out Thursdays at eight. Right. And you can't put it out all the time Thursday at eight and then be like, uh, mm-hmm. not this week. People right. Like that's when people, that's when they're, they're expecting it. Right. right. So like your mom's house comes out every Wednesday. Right. It's, and it's just like Wednesday's the day. Mm-hmm. So it'll, and we just, right now between studios, like Austin studio and LA studio, mm-hmm. And because of the what's taking long there, we're banking like recording episodes. Mm-hmm. But like I told my staff, I was like, "We're not, we're not missing. We're not missing. Like, yeah. like we're we're gonna bank, and we're now we're banked like into September right now." That was a big That's deal we when did. we started this podcast. Well, one, I was adamant. I was like, "It's not a podcast. It's a show." Yeah. Because I felt like the word podcast was gonna get played out, and podcasts have only gotten bigger. Yeah. And more popular since then. Sure. So I guess it's a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm but it was very. I was very adamant. Yeah. Because there was several conversations. Because you see, it's a lot of production and a lot of Absolutely. people work hard. That's impressive. To make this happen, but it was a very. It was a. I was adamant. I was like, we have to come out every Monday at the same time. I think that is. And we were doing like four or five episodes in the beginning. Yeah. Like. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. And or a then, day, like for four or five a day. Yeah. Yes, four but or five a day. But think about it. Like, it means that your fans can count on that. Mm-hmm. This comes out Mondays. It's mm-hmm. like they know it's there Monday. Mm-hmm. And like it, to a lot of people, it means a lot to yeah. a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's comfort. It. It's like, yeah, it's like I want the thing that you're putting out, man. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like you don't want to take that away from them. You financed your 2014 special, Completely Normal, All By Yourself. And it went mm. on to do a Netflix deal and yeah. did very well, which meant you did very well and you didn't have to pay back any investors. Not entirely true. Okay. Yeah, actually, you didn't have yeah. to pay back a lot of investors. I actually didn't finance it. Oh. So uh, New Wave, the company, uh, they financed it. But it's and I got a percentage of that deal. 
Oh, so you right? own it. Okay. Yeah, so they, they own a majority stake. I own some of it. But it has been beneficial in that it was li- like, I basically didn't get, like now I get a, 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 a talent fee right, right to do a special. Back then it was like a nominal fee. And, but you, have a, you own a percentage of it. And so now that special has been licensed to like different channels, airlines, like just all these places. So now that it's been out for seven years, you know, I, I get some, I see some benefit to right. that. Whereas the new model is that if you're a notable standup, you know, you'll get a, a, a big fee, but most standups don't get to own any piece of those, especially from like the big Once you give it, it's streamers. Done. Yes. I mean, there are a few people and I think they're, I can't say their names because they, this is their business, but th- I know a couple of comics that have turned down a percentage of money, significant money so that they can retain ownership. That's smart. And I'm like, wow, it's, mm. it's, it's really smart. Well, this is what happens when we have podcasters on people's party because you answer the question that I was about to ask. So thank you. Yeah. Um, completely normal. Uh, your bit about Steven Seagal. Yeah. It's hilarious. Thanks. He's out of his mind. Yeah, he's fucking crazy. We had Jeff Ross on. Mm-hmm. And um, you're friends with Jeff Ross. Right? Yeah, I know Love Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. And um, Jeff. The Roastmaster. Jeff said that uh, his real big break in the roasting thing came from roasting Steven Seagal. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that all the stories I've heard about Seagal are pretty terrible. You hear a lot of stories about him. A lot of stories. Okay. Consistently terrible. Like, the only person that I've... You ask people, you know, you ask somebody, hey, man, like, tell me about whatever, another common or something. You're like, right. he's a great guy. I don't right, know, man. Right, like, right. But like you go on a movie set and you're like, tell me about Seagal. And people are like, look, I don't talk shit about people, but I will talk shit about him. <laughs> and like they're like consistently right. saying what a terrible That's- person he is. <laughs> and I'm surprised that he was actually open to a roast. Right. That that surprises me. Yeah. I don't Because know he's like famously was- has... What, well, that's what Jeff Ross, Jeff's story is that he didn't mm-hmm. he didn't like the roast. Oh, right. that makes sense. Yeah, SNL pretty much um, for the people that are like the longtime producers and writers mm-hmm. there, it's pretty consistently they say he's the worst guest they've ever, guest host they've ever had. <laughs> oh. I, I get along with Don Lemon now. We we had Don Lemon on the Don show. Don Lemon. But one of my f- most famous Don Lemon. <laughs> one of my most famous um, <laughs> viral moments is me arguing with him uh-huh. while I was in Ferguson on CNN. Uh huh. And I'm just calling out CNN and he's defending CNN and we're just going back because uh-huh. a very very heated argument. And for years, people would just tell on. Tell on Don Lemon to me. Like, they'd be like, Do you know what else this yeah. motherfucker did? <laughs> yeah. Did you see Don Lemon last night? You know yeah. what this fuck is? And that they'd be like, like I was like the yeah. guy to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're like, that's like. I've gotten so many Seagal <laughs> stories. And they're like, they're, a lot of them are fucking hilarious. Right. Like, even um, Tom Arnold mm-hmm. shot that movie with DMX. Uh-huh. And I don't know if it was Cradle of the Grave or, or Exit Wounds. Or one of those Wonder, right. with Seagal. Right. And they have a scene on a houseboat. Yeah. And uh, and by the way, John Leguizamo's got a story. Uh, Rob Schneider's got a story. They, there's, they've got tons of stories. <laughs> but Tom Arnold's was that they're on a houseboat. And so the director is like, all right, let's block this scene. Uh-huh. And Seagal's like, let's roll. <laughs> and they're like, well, yeah, no, we're gonna. But, <laughs> but let's block this out first because we're, we're on a boat that's on the water. Mm-hmm. And Seagal was like, I said, roll. And they're like, all right. So... Like, take one, action. Seagal says his line, opens the door, falls into the water. <laughs> and he comes up, and they say, you just see his dark black ink running down his face. <laughs> you know, he has, like, jet black right. hair, and he's, like, 60 fucking three right. or something. 20 years ago. Yeah, but, like, he had, like, jet, jet. He has, even right. now, his hair looks insane. Right. Schneider's story is that I think it was the week that he was, he was doing maybe SNL. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm, forgive me if I'm wrong on that timing, but that Seagal walked into the room that Snyder was in and was like, I just read the greatest script I've ever read in my life. <laughs> and that Rob Schneider was like, fucking, that's awesome. Who wrote it? And he goes, I did. <laughs> but, that's like, a great story. But it's like, it's real. You know, he's, right. not, he's not joking. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's hilarious. Yeah. So it's just like, uh, like, I mean, John Leguizamo's is that he fucking... It was like day one of rehearsal, mm-hmm. and he was like, uh, "Oh, hey, what's up?" And 
one of the first things Seagal said to him was something like, just so you know, whatever I say goes. <laughs> and he did that. <laughs> right. He laughed. He laughed. Well, Seagal's like 6'5". Oh, right. And Laguzano was, I don't know, like 5'9 or something. Right. And he said he fucking like knocked the wind out of him. Wow. Shoved him up against a wall. And he was like, fuck this guy. So, And he had to shoot a movie with him after that. But it's just like one Jeez. story after. And this, by the way, like I've, I don't know, I almost feel like you can detect that from him without knowing those stories. I remember being a kid at King's Plaza Mall and we all went to see Hard to Kill because there were Jamaicans in it and I lived in the Jamaican neighborhood and uh-huh. all the Jamaican kids were like, we're going to go see, yeah. you know, Screwface. Yeah. yeah. And he, like, he was just like killing all these Jamaicans with guns with just like one move. He just, one arm move. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Your impersonation of Steven Skull teaching cops how to do oh, yeah. self-defense is amazing. Well, that show is amazing. That show is like <laughs> so crazy where he's an, he's an actual deputized sheriff right first in louisiana and now in arizona and he's like they pretend like he has like robocop vision and shit (laughs) on the show but it's like a it's an insane it's an insane show yeah man so i want to talk to you about big daddy kane Mm -hmm. (laughs) you mentioned big daddy kane on your show yeah yeah shout out to our producer uh steve bermucci Mm -hmm. a wonderful guy but he sometimes like when he's writing the scripts Sometimes it's like in black voice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. Like a right Talib Kweli with the backflip flow. And I, I say to him, I say, you got to stop doing this because <laughs> this, this script is going to get thrown in the trash and then someone's going to find it and we're going to get canceled 20 years from now uh-huh. because they're like, you let a white guy write in black voice for your show. Sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, so, so I'm watching your special, right? Mm-hmm. And you start doing the black voice. Yeah. yeah. Which, I'll be honest with you, threw me the fuck off. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I was like, what the fuck is he doing? Yeah. But then as you do the bit, you're like, yeah, like when you go into the Big Daddy Kane part about it, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, this is where this is where the joke is. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And um, Big Daddy Kane came on your show, right? Yeah, he did. It, uh, it was a, it was a while. First of all, the story that I tell in that mm-hmm. special mm-hmm. about yelling to him mm-hmm. is a true story. Right. So you really yelled. I really did that to him. <laughs> I, I really did it outside the comedy store. Uh-huh. Before I was uh, a regular there, uh-huh. I was just one day literally standing outside. I, I think I had done some book show there, mm-hmm. and I saw a limousine pull up. Mm-hmm. And Kane got out with somebody, and like my brain just went like, that's Big Daddy Kane. Mm-hmm. You know? And I was like, sup, Kane? Like, I just yelled at him. <laughs> and he, I saw him be like, turn, and I like hid. <laughs> <laughs> And Did they like, escape out of your mouth or you were planning to say it? I was, no, it just was like impulsive, you know? Mm-hmm. It was impulsive. Mm-hmm. A couple years later, it's like one of those things, you know when something just like ruminates like in your mm-hmm. head, you go, I'm going to talk about it. It doesn't matter what it is. I started mm-hmm. telling this story mm-hmm. and I got it to a place where it was really working. Mm-hmm. So I did the bit. The bit was tied to like the first 48 bit. Mm-hmm. So like they, they kind of were tied together. And I, that special came out. And I, dude, I remember like it was yesterday. I'm, I wake up and I lived in a place where I had like weird cell phone reception. Mm. So that special came out in um, March of 2014. So it was like a month or so later mm. where I walk out to my car and it's like, there's just like a voicemail. So the phone doesn't ring, but you have a new voicemail kind of thing. Mm. I was like, oh. I put it to my ear and it's like, sup, Tom? This is Big Daddy Kane. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, he left me a voicemail. Uh-huh. And he's like, I'm chilling over. And he was over at Russell Peters' house. Mm-hmm. He's like, uh, you know, I'd like to meet you. And I was like, what? So I drove over to Russell's house. And he was, you know, super gracious. Mm-hmm. So nice about the bit. He's like, the bit's hilarious. The special is like, keep doing your thing. And mm-hmm. and then we actually did merch together. We did Sup Kane <laughs> merch <laughs> with like, we did we did multiple releases. Wow. Yeah, we did like- Big uh, drops only. Big drops only. <laughs> and um, he'll tell you, he's like, he's like, you can move merch. <laughs> so <laughs> like, it was, uh, it was wild, man. And yeah, like that was, man, I've been yelled, like TSA yells Sup Kane at me. Like, uh, <laughs> wow. Have you ever got any backlash for it? Mm, for the bit? Mm-hmm. No. I think, you know, when bits like that, here's the thing. Like, if you do a bit, like if you're a white guy, mm-hmm. you're doing a bit like that. Mm-hmm. A couple things that audiences sense intent. They mm-hmm. know if you're malicious. Like, you, they know it intuitively. Mm-hmm. And they go, is this funny? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I tore it all over with it. Mm-hmm. 
it would kill pretty consistently. Mm. So I think people were kind of like, you know, I mean, yeah, I had, I mean, I had black dudes yelling sub cane at me like <laughs> right. outside of shows because right. they were just saying basically we think it's a funny bit. Yeah, right. you know. If it's yeah. gonna be borderline, make it funny. Make it funny, like, it, and that's always the thing. Is it funny? And right. Like, you know, I've seen, like, if you're doing stand up, you're gonna strike out. And you're gonna see your friends strike out. Mm-hmm. And people try to find the line, and you cross the line, or you just miss it completely. And but you drop those bits, you know. Right. Like you, you, that's like the things you see in specials are usually because that thing has been working, mm-hmm. working. That's been working, yeah. And like, yeah. I mean, the foundation really of doing that is Florida, mm-hmm. and like high school football and like right. just hearing guys yell shit all the time and being like, I'm going to yell shit too. This is, <laughs> this is fun. I don't think Florida should ever be an example and ever reason people do anything. Oh, really? <laughs> you like, I am Florida. Man. <laughs> I lived in Florida so I can, I can. No, yeah. you can. Yeah. When we met in Vegas, you were going on before Dave Chappelle and Joe Rogan. Yeah. Now Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle are very good friends. Yeah. Joe Rogan is one of the most, if one of the most important uh, podcast voices and comedic voices sure. of a generation. Yeah, in my estimation, Joe Rogan underestimates his uh, his reach and his power to influence and impact the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm somebody who Joe Rogan has had jokes that I didn't find funny, mm-hmm. and I try not to be af- offended by comedy. Yeah, but he just had some jokes back in the days and some things that he said on his podcast. And as Joe Rogan has said in his comedy. Um, you know he's he's done so many so many podcasts, so many episodes of Joe Rogan oh, show. Yeah. You know you're 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 smoking weed, you're drinking, you're talking shit with your friends. You're it's no filter. Yeah. Right. And so sometimes I don't know. It's like okay, is this a joke or is this how you really feel? Mm-hmm. Or and that stuff becomes funny for me. So I didn't want to be, and I had never met Joe Rogan. Yeah. And I didn't want to be like the woke guy in the room. Sure. When Dave Chappelle's trying to hang out with his friends. Sure. So when they first started to do the Austin thing, I didn't go. Because I was like, let me let that thing be a Dave Joe thing. Right. Instead of it being like the Talib Kweli energy here. Sure. And I know that a lot of my fans don't fuck with Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. A lot of Joe Rogan fans don't fuck with me. I know this because they tell me. They tell me. <laughs> yeah, they come to Instagram and when I used to be on Twitter and they come and tell me like, you, I love Joe Rogan and I hate you. Like a lot really? of- Really? Yeah. Like a, a large part of, because of my politics and how- Yeah. I, I, Unspoken, outspoken, I am. Yeah. There's things I say that a, a, a pockets of his fan base disagree with. Sure. Um, and so I didn't put the, any of this on Dave. Right. And Dave was like, "Why? Why are you not in Austin? I'm doing all these. We come to Austin. We got this podcast we're doing together. We got to work." I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna go to Austin." So I find myself in rooms with Joe Rogan. I'm I'm performing get by, and I get off stage. He's like, "Oh my god, dude, that was fucking amazing. You're amazing." You know, and then we go to party and we're drinking and smoking together, and he's being so nice and so gracious. Yeah. And we're at the party. He's a teddy bear, dude. Yeah, he was, and I'm like, and I had to tell him, uh-huh. and I'm like, listen, um, there's some things you said that just didn't sit right with me, but you're being so gracious to me, and I want to tell you that you, you know, I appreciate it. And he's like, well, what did I say? You know, and yeah. I, I, I scratched the surface. I didn't go beneath the surface. I just said some things and we got into a conversation about it. And one thing he said to me, um, and I say this as someone who still doesn't agree with some things that he says on stage or in his podcast. But one thing that he said to me was, artists have to be willing to have the dialogue Mm. no matter what everybody else does. And it hit me like a ton of bricks because I was looking at Joe Rogan, the famous podcaster. Mm -hmm. I had forgotten because that version had became so big, I'd forgotten that, well, he's just an artist. Like, you're an artist that started your career with people like Dave Chappelle, right. which is why you have this relationship. Right. You know? And people are going to have people are gonna have friendships with people. Like, we had Michael Rappaport on the show. Mm-hmm. Him and Jasmine got into an argument. Did we? Michael has gone on to say wild shit after that. Michael? <laughs> like, you know, and I understand Dave's friendship with Joe Rogan and like me, me being friends with like Kanye and people being like fuck Kanye yeah 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 and I'm like yeah but you could say that I understand why you're saying that but I, I'm not gonna but say it's, that but I guess my friend yeah I'm yeah. not gonna say that and so that's how I look at Dave and Joe's thing but I say all that to say um, it's interesting to me the overlaps between my audience and Joe's audience mm-hmm. who are large part because these audience hate each other right but you fall in the middle of that right you know what I'm saying so does Dave yeah. And then that's interesting to me how that happens. Yeah, I think, you know, mo I think most of his fans, Joe's, mm-hmm. 
that like me, they they just like me as a comedian, mm -hmm. you know? So they're like, this guy, because Joe, I mean, like Joe, like Dave, like you, mm -hmm. you, know, you have friends from all walks of life that do all types of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I get thrown into um, – like Joe's opinions on something. Right. You know, like what from a fan base. They're mm -hmm. they're not like if Tom is friends with Joe, mm -hmm. Tom signs off on all of his opinions or or his politics or whatever. Like, you know, Joe weighs in on all these things. They they just see like we're two comedy buddies. Right. With the same way that Joe and Dave really are. People right. are just like, these are just yeah, they have two guys who do stand up and yeah, hang up. Yeah, they've been doing it for a long time. One thing that like I've noticed in the last few years is that you know Joe has become so popular, mm -hmm. so influential that like sometimes I've told him I go you know like I opened Twitter today and you're trending for something you said, right? But it's something that you've been saying mm -hmm. for years that I know like not like a crazy opinion on something, but like you're so influential now that you just sharing a thought on something. Mm is making the news, mm -hmm. which is like, it's kind of like a wow level. You know, we were talking about leaving the stratosphere today. It's like you're, mm -hmm. you're. He's in outer space. You're in outer space yeah. now. Like you just said that, you know, I don't know, like just you think that people shouldn't be doing, and, and then all of a sudden that's news. Mm -hmm. I go, I just, I just remember you saying that for like 10 years mm -hmm. and it not really affected me. And I think also the thing is like, maybe you say, you think the same with Kanye and people being like, pushing back is that I go, yeah, it's it's my friend mm -hmm. that I've known for like 15 years mm -hmm. that to me the foundation of my friendship is being comics and doing the road together and staying up late and having a drink and, mm -hmm. you know, joking and eating. Like that's my friendship. Yeah. Um, I can't weigh in on everything right. the guy has an opinion on or something. Right. Like I get that it bothers some people. Right. And, I, you know. And I have to, when I think about how you're presenting it, well, I'm sure, I'm positive that my friends don't agree with everything I say or do or how I present yeah. or, you know, I'm sure. Yeah. But, you know, that's a strange metric though, right? Like with friendship, with politics, especially with, with people apply that metric uh, to politicians and, and famous people. It's yes. like, I have to agree with everything you say to have is, an iota of respect for you. Which is absurd. Yeah. And like, how uninteresting is it right. to agree with somebody on everything? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like we're new friends and I'm like, I'm sure we don't agree on everything, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I don't want to like be friends with you. Right. You know, like I'm sure I could learn from some of it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I could just be like, no, I totally, I think you're wrong. And mm -hmm. like, I should be able to do that and still be friends with you. Right. You know, which I'm glad you said that because that's a great segue for me. Okay. Because you told the story about your friendship with Maceo from De La Soul. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that was a good story. I yeah. Think. Macy was a good friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and so that story went left a little bit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you told the story. I hope you don't mind if I share nah. some of it. But um you I, as a fan of De La Soul, you got with Maceo, similar type of relationship with like Big Daddy Kane. Like, yeah. it's like I like your comedy, yeah. saw some stuff you did. Yes. You invited him and uh, his, uh, his wife and his mother. I invited him. him and he, he invited brought them. Yes. his wife yes, yeah. and his mother yeah. to Tom's show. And you said the language you used. You said I did some off-color stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I did a joke that got like crazy oohs and ahs mm -hmm. from the audience, and was able to make the like mm -hmm. the set continue. Mm -hmm. But all like the only information I have, like when you break down, is that we were like talking, texting. He gave me a song for a short film, right? And that after that show, he was we he. he Said what's up to me after the show. I introduced him to John Witherspoon, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, we never talked again. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't think he liked that set. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, it was a different set than like the time that I met him. Uh -huh. I met him, I was opening for Tommy Davidson. Mm -hmm. I was opening for Tommy Davidson at the West Palm Beach Improv. Mm -hmm. And he came in and was like bug eyed about my set right he really liked it he really liked right. it and he was so gracious and that's when he was like take my number mm -hmm. and like we you know we just started talking i would just talk, call him and i would just at dude it was wild right and i can't I wait for him. Maceo to see this yeah yeah <laughs> uh what's up vince so <laughs> uh but like yeah he he was super nice to me man and he let me just on you know i say let me i'm like this middle act mm -hmm. and i could just ask maceo questions about mm -hmm. Daylaw's 
discography. I mean, it was nuts. He's such a gracious guy. He was a, he was gracious so gracious. Woman, yeah. And then I'm like, I need a song for this short that I made. Mm-hmm. Sends me music. Let's me put it on the thing. And like, yeah, I just, I walked away from that being like, damn, like. That's my question. Does it feel different when someone you respect creatively takes issues with a joke? I think so. Yes. But ultimately, you know, I'm now after all these years of doing it, mm-hmm. like, and I don't mean this, this can sound like disrespectful or, or like I'm shitting on someone. Mm-hmm. But if anybody is like, no, I don't. Um, I'm not cool with your jokes about this or that. My honest take is like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing my jokes, man. Like, that's yeah. what I do. And I understand that, like, you might go, I really can't with that joke. All right, man. But, like, right. you know, unless I, you, you really have a compelling argument mm-hmm. for me to stop doing it, like, I, well, this is what I do. Well, are supposed to apologize, right? Yeah. And I you mean, said in the, in the bull hog, you said something very interesting. You said... I believe that you have a right to be offended by anything, but you don't have a right to do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, I my thing is like, when you say I'm offended, it's like saying I'm tired. Mm-hmm. Like, you should take a nap. Take a nap. Yeah. Like, EPMD. And if you're tired, yeah. then go take a nap. Go take a nap. Yeah. Man. yeah. <laughs> Word up. So, I mean, I get it. And I also, I also feel like after long enough of doing stand-up, you re- I, I realize that I'm never going to argue with somebody mm-hmm. Who goes like, I don't find you funny. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. That's cool. Yeah. I'm the same way with music. I I argue with people a lot, but people think that I argue over music. I never, never do. For me, it's like a social issue or something like that. Of course. But like, you you don't like my music. Oh, okay. If you don't like my comedy, Mm -hmm. I'm so comfortable with that. Literally comfortable with that. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of fans that like what I do. That's right. I will play to them. Um, And I actually, if you go like, you know, who I like... Go, go listen to him. Right. Go to that show. And support that. Yeah, go, man. And that would actually benefit you more than you're yeah, telling me. Yeah, why waste your energy yeah, on me right. and how much you don't like me? Yeah. <laughs> go tell somebody else. Now, you're on Netflix. Um, Netflix describes completely normal as level-headed. Uh-huh. Level-headed. Are you aware of this? No. Like the write-ups, you're always like, who wrote this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'm sort of new to Netflix, newish to Netflix. Uh-huh. Like I wasn't on Netflix when, they, like when, when they Orange was the New mail? Black was popping. Yeah, oh, I wasn't kidding. watching Netflix. Yeah, the whole way, like, like, like they'll put like a Kevin Hart movie up there and it'll be like Goofy, Zany, and yeah. that makes me be like, I'm not watching that movie. Yes, I don't want to watch Goofy, Zany. Yeah. Is it is it funny? <laughs> yeah, I'll watch funny. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So. Level-headed is completely normal. <laughs> I feel like that's a very strange description for a comedian. Yeah. Um, by mostly stories, you've become bearded, bawdy, and comically bitter, according to Netflix. That's what it says on your special. Okay. Disgraceful that says you are sorted. Okay. <laughs> sorted. <laughs> so Netflix is making judgment calls here. They're making a lot of judgment calls. <laughs> what you learn about Netflix, which is kind of fascinating, uh-huh. I mean, really fascinating, mm-hmm. is that most of us look at Netflix as an entertainment company Mm -hmm. and insiders look at Netflix as a data company Yeah, Mm. that is, has the world's best engineers Mm -hmm. that they, they know when you press pause, they know when you skip things, they know when Mm -hmm. you start and stop. When you're sleeping. When you're sleeping, you know that when you release a a special, for instance, they bring you in for this marketing meeting Mm -hmm. and they will show you like ball hog, the Mm -hmm. last special with 20 different art covers, right? Mm. And what they're doing is they go, well, this art cover probably will work. We've we've studied and found that this will work better in Brazil. More people will click it if it looks like this, and it'll click it like this in India and this in France. And then let's say I pop up on your algorithm because you've watched other specials and you haven't watched Ball Hog, they'll start changing the artwork to something that they have found that you've clicked on, like a style that you like. Wow. So it's 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 you know those write ups I think are kind of tied into that yeah. where they're going like this wordplay this type of description for whatever reason is working mm. sorted sorted <laughs> it's very sorted, sorted bearded body I'm gonna level call headed comedian Netflix sorted for doing that I love Netflix <laughs> but they've definitely messed up my algorithm because now all I get is kids shows because of Coco Melon oh yeah so. you got to set up that other profile I'm on my mom's profile I don't pay for it okay. so I kind of gotta you know whatever. But I've been using my siblings' ones so mm-hmm. that I don't get so many 
kid shows. It's like, yeah. I want to see sex, not Coco Melon. Exactly. But um, <laughs> on the podcast, you host with Brett Kreshner, which <laughs> I... <laughs> Keep going. What? Don't no no. Please keep going. Did I say his name? No right? no. You said it perfect. You said it perfect. Because I was going to say I absolutely bit. love Brent, him. Brent Crystals. He, yeah, Brent Crystals. There you go. Yeah. I absolutely love him. Side note. Yes. He um. You has, really love him? Do you really love him? Though? I do. He's okay. judged a couple of my roast battles. He did. And he told me I was going to be a star. Okay. There you go. So uh, well, shout out to definitely Brett. Definitely love him. Yeah. Shout out to Brett. Um, but you guys yeah. have a podcast, Two Bears One Cave. Yes. And you guys had a weight loss competition we in did. which. You told uh, your audience to fat shame you yes. if you were losing, and it obviously worked. It did. Because um, <laughs> you went on Conan, you said it was effective, and you won. Did mm -hmm. you get a prize, and was that prize pizza? Uh, you know, the funny <laughs> thing was, <laughs> that we did, we did weigh-ins for two days mm -hmm. instead of one, which made it harder. It mean, you like, really had to be, you couldn't just do like a one-day water cut yeah and just so not we did, eat that day yeah we did two days water cuts which is dangerous i actually got a few prizes from that to answer your question bert asked for pizza on the <laughs> second day and they they brought they brought it and then rogan sent us to san francisco to watch the uh, warriors Cavs play so we got the like great seats to watch lebron and steph go at it when when he was with the Cavs. Mm -hmm. And then Ari Shafir, who had challenged us to lose weight, took us to the national championship game in Atlanta, and we got to see Alabama and Georgia play. Wow. Time out. What? <laughs> I know who Bert Christner is. I said Brett. Is that why you keep saying his name The wrong? reason why I said Brett <laughs> is because I was sabotaged, and it says Brett on my paper. Okay, okay. can I tell you something, though? What? It is a long-standing bit <laughs> that people purposely mispronounce his name. Okay, I right. did not do that purposely. Yeah, but I know don't it's... cut it. Okay, right. now we're gonna leave well, all they... of this in. It's fantastic. Well, then cut the second part, and we'll just pretend well, I actually, did the joke. Actually, but let's not gloss over the fact that you pronounced both of his names wrong. What? That's true. The first and the second one. So yes, and even when you even corrected funny. it, you said it wrong the second time. <laughs> Because you're such a big fan. Yeah. You're like, I <laughs> love Bert Kirshner. I'm a fan of him because he said I was going to be a star. But I do follow him on Instagram, and he's I do best. love the naked pics. He's I the mean, best. The, the topless pics. He's a sweetheart. Pics. He's the greatest guy. He's great. Guys he's the machine. Guys trying to sabotage me. I'm never going to get books now. <laughs> no, no. You're, you're fine. <laughs> no, that's funny. It's funny because um, like when I was doing my research to talk to you, that name Brett Crystals kept coming up. <laughs> I did not say crystal. No, but that name kept coming up. And I'm like, I was so confused. I'm like, who is this Brett Crystal's guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I finally, when I finally put it together, I was like, oh, this is a whole thing. Oh, man. Because, you know, he was, he's been shooting this movie in Serbia for the last three and a half months. And he just got back. And people have been like, like they messaged me, when is Brad back? When is, when is Bart back? When right. is when it's is just a white name with like a they B? Just, that's they, what, that's what, it. What, they right. just go a B and a C sound, and that's right. it. And it's like me with the bends earlier. There you go. Yeah, yeah. In your special, um, you say you have a, a bit called very funny, very funny bit. I saw a fight. Oh yeah. Right? In which you discuss how there is no white guy solidarity. Right. White dude solidarity. White guy solidarity. None. I mean, what you said, and you talk about how other marginalized groups and other groups of people come together racially, have each other's back, have each other's back. I want to know because I asked a white friend of mine recently if they heard this this rhyme and they had not. So I was like, is this something that only black people know? <laughs> so I want to know if you ever heard the phrase a fight, a fight, a nigga and a white. If the white boy wins, we all jump in. I've heard a version of that. Okay. I've heard a version of that. And I heard it. You heard the version with the white version. <laughs> no, I heard it like that. Um, but like uh, it was it was told to me mm -hmm. years later from somebody uh, from Florida. Mm -hmm. Because I said I when I when I moved to Florida I moved to Florida when I was a freshman in high school mm -hmm. I had never heard open like open racism mm -hmm. and I heard it day one in Florida where I was like like and and I I had left Florida mm -hmm. and somebody had told me that riddle or whatever right and I was like I that was the first time I had heard it mm -hmm. but they were from Florida and they were like you know that thing I was yeah. like no yeah I, I noticed that like. I feel like that's something we just say to each other. Some certain things only black people know about. Mm -hmm. This is funny because I obviously can't play anymore. Mm -hmm. But I was like a decent but basketball player. But were you playing? Player. I was playing basketball. <laughs> and a, she got jokes. A white kid, mm -hmm. like I just schooled some kid. Mm -hmm. and he was like, You play like a, you know? And I was like, What? <laughs> he said it so casually. <laughs> and I 
was like, what? Wait, the white kid said this? Yeah, oh, to me. No. You know what's crazy? I had that same experience with a white kid. But I was, I was 10 years old, maybe 11. I was a kid, Italian kid, Nick. It's traumatized me. I always tell this story because I was traumatized by it. I, he was on my soccer team. I was the one black kid on the soccer team in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he's, we, we challenged each other to a race. And I won the race. And I was so happy. Like, you're 11 years old. You raced, the, and he's the best kid on the team. Mm -hmm. I turned, ah, I won, I won. Of course you won. You're a nigger. <gasps> like, and I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't have any comeback. Yeah. I didn't have, I didn't. And the next time I got called that word, I beat the shit out of the kid. But it was like, it was for Nick. Yeah, yeah, it was for, yeah. Yeah. It was for the first kid, yeah. That's yeah. why. Ugh. But what I like about that joke is, and I don't even know if you did this intentionally. You could tell me if you did, but. It really is a very subtle critique on how insidious white supremacy is. It, it, it's intentional. Yeah. Like when you talk about those guys are the ones who, with the torches, mm -hmm. that, that part of it to me is the meat of it because it's like you're explaining why being pro-women is not anti-men. Right. Being pro-black is not anti-white. Of course. And you're explaining why- when people band together based on whiteness, that's only based in violence. Yeah, I mean, it's to me, it's always been kind of like silly mm -hmm. that you have that it would need to be explained mm -hmm. because it seems so transparently obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, when somebody uh, goes, "Well, why does uh, why do Black Lives Matter? Like, why do you have to mm -hmm. say that?" And you're like, "Because it sure seems like they don't." Right. Right. Like. Right? I mean, yeah. like you have to make a point to say it. Yeah. You don't have to make a point to say it about right. other groups because we react, we treat it differently. Right. So it's just, yeah, to me it's like, wh why are we even having this? You talk about, you don't mention race in this other joke, but it's, it's, it's hard for me to not to think about race when you do this other joke, when you talk about weed laws and how paranoid we used to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being like a black kid in New York City under Giuliani, like smoking stress weed with seeds in it, with sprayed with pesticides. Yeah. Reggie? And as soon, yeah, as soon as, not even Reggie, like just fucking Baba Ganui. Like, I don't <laughs> even know, like the fucking, like this shit was so, the weed was so terrible. And as soon as you smoke it, you're instantly stressed out mm -hmm. because you feel like you're going to get arrested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when we were in Vegas for the Chappelle show, I went to Planet 13 and I was upset. 14 year old me was upset. Yeah. Because I'm like, so many people got fucking arrested for this shit and railroaded for this shit. It's on their record forever. And I'm in a weed superstore. Yeah. And the customer service is amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, it's like way better customer service than like- Walmart? Than anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. we. I mean, I think back on those days, like in high school and college where- Taking like three hour round trips, yeah. you know, to like like wooded areas to right. get to get like ten dollars in weed, right. or you're like, oh my god, and and you're scared mm -hmm. on the way there during the transaction, mm -hmm. on the way back, you know, and then you smoke in the car and fuck, then you're even ten times mm -hmm. more, and the and like the the absurdity of the law of those laws existing, and you know, you know, we're gonna get to a point where it, there it's legal everywhere mm -hmm. but it might be at the end of our lives you right know? let's compare our experiences at the nike employee store in portland because i feel like our experiences are vastly different <laughs> they really are yeah and so, now i'm by the way i'm so back on board but go ahead okay you're back on board you they will you back I'm, in i'm back on the switch Is it team. ever since the special you know what it was it's so funny so i had this thing where i was up in portland mm -hmm. and i didn't know anything about how any of this works mm -hmm. right and i go i get a um Somebody to go, I'm going to take you to the, the Nike employee place, mm -hmm. and you get 50% off. Mm -hmm. I was like, fucking, let's bring a U-Haul, yeah. you know? And, the, and they set it up for me, and the next day I got a call from Nike, and they said, you can't come here. Mm -hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? And they used that term. They go, you're a person of influence. Right. I go, what the fuck does that mean? And they're like, you're a, a notable entertainer. Right. And I'm like, so I'm not allowed to shop there? And they're like, yeah, you're not allowed to shop here. So I called my manager. I'm like, how is that a thing? And he goes, well, I can set you up at the uh, Celebrity Center mm -hmm. in LA. And I go, oh, great. Okay. And he goes, that's just free. I was like, oh, that's even better. Right. But I get back and I was like, well, I want to go. 
because I'm going to go shoot this special. Right. And they were like, yeah, they, it was something like just scheduling. They're like, well, mm. like not Tuesday, but Saturday. Mm. And I was like, no, no, I, I need to get it so I can go shoot it on Saturday. Mm. And for whatever reason, it didn't pan out. And I, I was just in my feelings about it. <laughs> and so I started, like, in that week leading up to it, started telling that story. Right. And it started to get this, like, big, re- you know how it is. Like, yeah. You get the reaction, you're like, oh, I'm going to keep saying this. Right. I start telling this story about how, fuck them. Right. And, uh, I'm wearing Adidas. I'm wearing Adidas. <laughs> right. And so Adidas sent me a shitload <laughs> of stuff. Like, they sent me so much stuff. And they kept sending it. Uh-huh. And I got it in my head that like, oh, I'm like an Adidas endorser, <laughs> which I'm like, I'm not. Yeah, he's, I'm an influencer. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm like, so like, I, I like started donating all my Nikes mm-hmm. and like and my closet. <laughs> you were like, like, I'm like totally ride or die. Ride or die, three right. stripes. And then, I mean, because they sent me clothes, jackets, hats, shoes, like everything. And like, you know, a few months would go by and another shipment would come. I mean, they were, it was super nice, right? Mm-hmm. Then like after, I don't know, like a year or something, I mean, I would walk out and people immediately be like, oh yeah, you got your Adidas on, like, you know, right. like fans. And, and I was right. like, oh yeah. <laughs> and then one day it's like, I saw some, I don't know, some Jordans or something. And I was like, oh, it I'd always, like to, it only I, takes one pair of Jordans. One pair of Jordans. I'm like, <laughs> I'd like to buy those, <laughs> right. but, but I can't right. because I'm an Adidas guy. <laughs> and then like I sat there, I'm like, wait, what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> I can totally buy those right. and wear those. Right. And I remember, the, so the I hadn't worn a Nike product in like, I'm telling you, like a year to year and a half. Mm-hmm. And I, I go to do a show. I think I'm somewhere up in Washington. I walk out of the green room and immediately someone goes, the fuck are you doing wearing those? <laughs> and I was like, what? And they're like, I thought you wore Adidas. I'm like, I mean, dude, I'm just wearing these. Right. And they're like, but you're not an Adidas guy? I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> so I go on stage and people are like, why are you wearing a Nike? And I'm like, so I immediately like from just the have audience. To, from the audience. Right. So I immediately like have to talk about it. And then I was like, I'm crazy. What am I thinking? Like, I'm not, it's not like they're paying me to where I can buy whatever right. products, you know, I want to wear. So I started to, to actually just buy stuff and not think about it. And it's died dead now people, but they, they still, like I did a show right in that period where these people came to the show and in Adidas track suits uh-huh. and they sat there and they were like, and then they saw me come out in Nikes <laughs> and they were like, what? What happened? Like, <laughs> they were so disappointed. But you, I imagine. Just- so here's my story. So I've been touring for most of my life. And whenever we go to Portland, there's always some guy from the Nike employee store who's like, come to the Nike employee store and get 50% off. Yep. And it's always me and a crew of people who love Nikes. Yeah. So we're like, yeah. And we go and they happily take my money, Tom. What? And that's the end of my story. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's it. Like my story they let is, you shop. I go and shop in that's the Nike Play Store. I am clearly not a person of influence. This is crazy to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly not big enough. I don't understand to this. not to be banned from the Nike Employee Store. Yeah, and I didn't understand. I was I, I kept pressing. <laughs> I kept pressing the person. Right. Who was like, "You can't come here." I'm like, "What do you mean? Right. I will buy stuff." Right. And they're like, "No, no, no." No, they took my money. Yeah. Um, on Tom Talks podcast, you joke about you can tell RZA smokes a lot. Uh, a lot of weed because his nickname is Bong Bong. <laughs> well, and, he says it a lot, yeah. And Ball Hog, mm-hmm. you joke about, well, we don't know if it's a joke, but uh, you say that your friend slept with all of the Wu Tang members. <laughs> have you ever gotten any, um, have you ever been approached by a Wu Tang member for that joke? No, and I did fear it for a, like for a minute. I was like, oh man, like. Somebody could get upset about that story. And yeah, I, and not I, really. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think people, you know, cast it off to uh, to just being a, a bit. But um, I think before that came out, I was on a flight. I have a crazy track record um, flying with black celebrities, mm-hmm. like so many. <laughs> and one time it was Method Man. Which airline? Man, it's been a few. You better, you better pick it right. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's Soul Plane. No, it was, um, it is like, like uh, with Method Man, I was like so geeked out mm-hmm. too. You know, I was like, I couldn't believe it. We were on a six twenty a.m. flight Oof. from Fort Lauderdale to L.A., and we both slept the whole flight basically. Mm-hmm. And when we landed, you know, you're like, you're just like that deep. Mm-hmm. Or I didn't sleep. And it was like, I was so groggy. Mm-hmm. And I got up and uh, 
I, go, I reach in my bag, and he's like six three. Yeah, he's a big guy. He's a big dude. And he he goes like he says something, and I was like, wait, what's that? And he was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> And then I didn't want to say, like, what's that again? Right. So I was just like, yeah, man. <laughs> and then I was, like, hating myself for not knowing what he said. Right. And so I grabbed my bag. I'm, like, bummed out. I'm like, man, that man just said something to me. <laughs> and I don't know what he said. Right. And I step off the plane to the jet bridge, and he's waiting for me. And I'm like, what's up? And he goes, right? And I go, <laughs> what? <laughs> and he goes, that guy. And I go, what guy? He goes, the guy in front of you. He wouldn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> And I had no idea what he was talking about. Right. And I was like, yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck that, that guy. That, that was the right answer, yeah. Tom. I was like, fuck him. And fuck he was like, that right. guy. And then we walked fuck all the way to, that. fuck right. everything about that dude. <laughs> then we walked to baggage claim together, and I was just like, this is the best. That's yeah. awesome. Shout yeah. out Method Man. Method Man is such a good dude. That's interesting that you say that, because, again, in Bull Hog, you say that we all like watching black people have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. That's my father's quote. <laughs> Yes. He's not wrong. Yeah. Um, He's literally, that is a <laughs> real, like a real quote of his. Yeah, I believe From you. being on a cruise. Right, the cruise the cruise thing Carnival. is hilarious. And he's just like, buddy, I love watching black people. I'm like, <laughs> don't say that, man. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk in recent media, uh, black joy being a counterpoint to black pain. Why do you think it is that people... And I'm talking about all people, black people, white people, people who all love to see black people have so much fun. We so cool. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is that simple in a way. It, it, it really is. I mean, like when you, when you talk about some of my dad, right? My dad's mm -hmm. a 72, 73-year-old white guy from Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. who's just like, you know, a steak and potatoes. Guy. Like he's literally, like I've been with him where like you, you're on vacation mm -hmm. and you walk, you walk into like, you know, where you hear the music playing and I don't know, black people on the, <laughs> the dance rhythm, floor. Right. The yeah. Dance. And like, you know, he's just like, I could watch this for hours. <laughs> like, I mean, how do you explain it? I don't know. Like, and I get that it's, I get what he's saying. Right. Like, he's like, he's like, my friends don't do this. Right. Like, uh, this is like unique. And it, you know, you could say like, yeah, that's, that's black culture. That's mm. part of what that is. And why do people, I don't know, but people definitely love it. Yeah, like, they do. Yeah, they do. People love it because you look at, Everything from pop culture, music, like every mm -hmm. dance that's popular basically mm -hmm. comes from black culture, you know, mm -hmm. or not all, but a, a huge percentage. Right. Um, when you look at, like, I'm a big sports fan too. Like, I look at how, as a kid, like, you meant, we mentioned, like, why do you like FSU? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a kid and I'm watching basically an all black team kick the shit out of people mm -hmm. and, like, and, like, like flex it. like it was a, like the uh, the birth of swag you know right, like right. Dion high stepping into the end zone it's like I don't know it, like it looks fun right it looks fun yeah. and and if you're like a white kid and like you're grow up in let's say the white suburbs you're not exposed to that so mm -hmm. when you see it you're like this is awesome like right. who wouldn't right. want to fucking go to this the trick is though especially if you start to participate in the art the trick is to be willing to deal with the pain and to be an ally right. exactly. when it's time to That's be. a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you can't just be a, what, a culture vulture, right? right? And um, go like, I like these good things and I'm going to ignore everything <laughs> right, else. Right, right, right. Um, which, yeah, like, I mean, a lot of people can fall into that, but I mean. You, I think that that's what makes that joke funny though. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that, that's the unsaid part of, of the joke. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, for encouraging people to manage their expectations. Oh, yeah. It's actually one of my favorite phrases. I say this to trolls on the internet all the time. Yeah. Quali, I'm so disappointed. Manage your fucking expectations yeah. better. Yeah. You know, <laughs> for real. I say this all the time. It, it, um, it will help you to be happier in life. Oh, facts. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be help you to be, to be happier in life. You can manage your expectations with everything. You're with going Everything. to the movies, Everything. with relationships, friendships, with friendships, mm -hmm. you, you know, with dating, with uh, with with watching a podcast. Like, yes. you, you know, it's, it's manage like, your expectations about what you think you're going to see on this podcast. Manage you your will expectations enjoy life much more. Yeah. Um, another thing you encourage is for people to pursue their dreams. Yes. Um, why is pursuing dreams so important? And also, when do you feel someone should give up their dreams? Which I think never. Um, it's a good. It's a or good maybe point. balance them with real world concerns. Well, you can't be delusional, right? right? 
But I'm somebody, and I, you know, it feels kind of like uh, I don't know, hokey kind of saying it. Mm-hmm. But like, I went after my dream. Mm-hmm. As and, did I. Yeah. As did I. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, I look at the fact that I moved to Los Angeles mm-hmm. when I was 22 years old. My r- original pursuit was I wanted to be a comedic actor, mm-hmm. and I kind of fell into trying stand up and fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to pursue this. And I look back on, I remember so many conversations. My mother loudly was like, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, go get a real job. And friends did that. And like, I didn't waver from it. You know, you have peaks and valleys and highs and lows, Mm -hmm. but how rewarding and fulfilling it is to pursue a dream Mm -hmm. and actually achieve like some of your goals. Mm -hmm. And I go like this is that's been it's been the ride of a lifetime that I've gotten to do this, you know. So I just feel like um, I would be I would be doing a disservice to people mm-hmm. if I um, if I didn't encourage them to do the same exactly. because it's been like it's been an amazing thing when I look back on you know the last twenty years mm-hmm. like between like. Like, like I said, the shitty places I lived and, and like the bad shows and like all the things that could go, but you go like, it was all worth it. It was all mm. worth it because I went after what I wanted to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, now I get like these, I have these, I have this incredible life. I have an incredible life. And it's like, I, I, I really tie it to going after a dream. Same. So I encourage people to do it. And I also feel like you have to be a realist. You know, one thing I would do every year as a comic, especially like on those early years, I would look at myself at the end of the year mm-hmm. and go like, honestly, how did this year go versus mm. last year? Mm. And not just, you know, there's the things you can measure, like, did I make more money? But did I, did I get better? Mm-hmm. Was I, am I a better comic? And I, I would consistently feel like, yes. Mm-hmm. Like, I would consistently feel like I'm trying more stuff, I'm getting better. Mm-hmm. And then things are working out for me on the business side of it. But it was like, you know, you have to check yourself with those things. Like, you know, because there are there are highly delusional people mm-hmm. in comedy Get and in music. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you see. And they're just like still at it. And you're like, mm-hmm. you're fucking 60. What are you doing? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I think most of us have the ability to kind of look at it. I mean, you probably had like a similar thing, right? Where you're like looking at the trajectory of the way things are going Mm -hmm. and you're pushing yourself as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. And then you're also seeing the benefits of pursuing that dream. Mm -hmm. The ridiculous, preposterous dream of being a rapper. (laughs) Like it's fucking insane. I posted a thing on my IG recently um, with uh, Jay-Z. The language he used, he said, there's a knowing in being an artist. He said, you got to know that it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. What doesn't make sense? Everyone's telling you get a regular job. Everyone's telling you, you have to know against the odds, and um, that to me is the sweet spot. Yeah. That knowledge, that having to do this in the pandemic last year, I spent a lot of time with comedians, and to see these comedians were in physical pain because they couldn't get on stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have to do this. I have, ah, what am I going to do with my life? Yeah, you know, it was and, terrible. And people in the pandemic, a lot of people who are not comedians or, or singers or entertainers or artists. For I mean, the artists have to make art, right? But a lot of people um, whose lives were disrupted in that way, I'm seeing a lot of mental health issues and people are not able to bounce back, especially when the world starts to open back up. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people spiral out of control, wipe out. Um, I can't imagine not having my art. I might have spiraled out of control if I didn't have my art. I, I, I had to reach for something. And I, mm-hmm. l- my luck is that we put so much into podcasting mm-hmm. when we did because it had an established fan base. Mm-hmm. We were able to keep doing it and do like these crazy live shows. Yeah. I missed stand up so much though. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, it, I didn't realize it at first. At first, I remember that I had March dates, right? Stand up shows that my agent was like, well, he's moving to April. Right. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. You yeah, know, like a month off. The same thing. It's nice. Yeah. Take a little break for a month. Yeah. Then they moved the, the April stuff to May. Uh-huh. And then in May, they're like, I don't think it's going to happen this summer. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? What What world is this? Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. And then it started to get, yeah. And, I, you know, I had something to fall back on, which I think was a real lifesaver. But I also felt like started to really be concerned about some of my, you know, peers. Yeah. And people who 
were really struggling. Mm -hmm. And I and it bums me out when I think about the comedians that were you know, maybe they were transitioning from being a middle act to just starting a headline, mm -hmm. or they're starting to middle a lot, and they're like starting to develop, and then everything ends for them. Yeah, a lot of those careers are derailed forever. Yeah, you you're know? right. You're right. It was it was a rough thing for artists. Yeah, yeah, this show definitely saved me because right, I wasn't on stage at all. I was doing Zoom shows, but it's just like kind of not the same. And at least knowing that, okay, I'm 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 getting up and getting dressed to do something yeah. that's creative was definitely a lifesaver. Another thing that was interesting in Vegas was the night after we did our first show together, um, Garth Brooks was in town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you and your fans at some point started trolling Garth Brooks? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was... Uh, you know, I it's one of those things where you don't realize entirely uh -huh. what's going to happen. Right. When you, you know, we do all types of silly, stupid right. bits. Right. So he announced a tour mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, "Fucking!" I didn't realize how long ago it's been. Right. I, I saw an article about it. There's a couple of articles about it now. Wow. Okay. Um, but he announced this tour that he was like, "It's called the Big Ass Stadium Tour," <laughs> and and. Uh, He's very emotional. He's a really emotional guy. Uh -huh. And I think like during the the announcement of this tour, which is like a tour to go play his music, mm -hmm. he got like super emotional. And I was like, and I jokingly was like, this guy has killed people before. <laughs> and Christina was across from me and she goes, well, you think he's killed a lot of people? I was like, two or 300. Yeah. <laughs> and so- I, again, jokingly said, like, where are the bodies, Garth? Right. And now if you go to his Instagram, I've it, seen it. it is doing thousands it. of comments it. with each post. And they're, they're, they're also- asking him where the bodies are. Wow. Where the bodies are. Give me back my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I haven't seen my grandmother since your show. And then, <laughs> and then they started to like, just write, uh, like, we have so many inside jokes and clips that we play mm -hmm. that have weird- phrases uh -huh. like and they'll write those as comments and then every once in a while you'll see a genuine garth fan just be like what's going on right. what is all this why are they asking what a banana split is like, right. what, what's what's happening here and it's just taken off a, a life of its own it makes me laugh so if i ever like need a laugh during the day uh -huh. i go to his instagram <laughs> and i just read the comments it's the little things yeah. it's the little things yeah yeah, yeah. Little Love it. Shout out to Garth Brooks. Did you get to go to that show? No, and Donnell. So Shout Donnell, out to Donnell, Donnell, really trying to make Donnell that happen. Here at people's party. Well, he was a uh, Thursday. He goes, "You want to see Garth Brooks tomorrow?" And I was like, "Okay." And then on Friday, he's like, "You ready to go tomorrow?" I was like, "No, you said tomorrow yesterday. That's today." <laughs> right. I'm like, "I can't go tomorrow." He's like, "I'm disappointed in you, man." I was like, "Shut the fuck up, man." But like, tomorrow means tomorrow. Right. Like, tomorrow. You should have said tomorrow. Saturday on right. Thursday. So yeah, but he was like, he was like, that would have been the shit. You and I at the Garth Brooks show. I yeah. go, yeah, it would have been. I would go, by the way. He would have been what they refer to as the fly boy in the buttermilk. Yeah. Right. I was, I've was. i been that before. You I, have? I've been to, I went to a Metallica show in Texas once. How was that? Oh, wow. It was amazing. It was a good show? It was an amazing show. Tommy Lee, in some contraption, playing the drums, played Simon Says. Metallica played Simon playing Says like by that? Farrell Munch. Yeah. But I was the only black guy there. It was amazing. Tommy Lee's dope. Shout out to Tommy Lee. Yeah. He's, he's been on the really podcast. Dope. So, man, thank you for being on the show. Of course. Um, you have been a wonderful guest. I'm so glad to have you on the show. I'm, an honor to, I'm honored to be a guest, yeah, really. Yeah, man, this has really been really beautiful. I'm coming everywhere tour. Uh -huh. I'm a guy, I toured more than every rapper yeah. before the pandemic. Yeah. So I pride myself on being able to go everywhere. Yeah. I don't hold a candle to you. And this is only the first two legs. There's two more legs coming wow. that are... It's, it's a bananas tour. I love the promo. You were like, listen, I'm coming everywhere. If you ask me if I'm coming to your town, the answer is yes. And the show is probably likely sold out already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've added a bunch of shows. Right. And um, and people, like, I, every announcement I make, I'm like, these are not all the cities, though. Mm -hmm. There will be another announcement. Because there are other places included in everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, including Denver, Minneapolis, Phoenix, and international dates. I put it up. Tallahassee. And right away, they'll go. Where's the Denver show? <laughs> Why aren't you doing any international That's dates? That's what that promo was for. Yeah, yeah. Right, so it's everywhere. like, every, you know, I go, it's fucking everywhere, man. <laughs> like, it's my tour ends in uh, April 2023. So it's a, it's, it's a crazy tour. 
I don't want to take up any more of your time. You got a lot of touring to do. A lot, a lot of touring to do. <laughs> but I really appreciate. You know, it was it was a it was so fun. I told you it was genuinely mm-hmm. when I when I walked into that arena and they're like. Uh, Talib Kweli's on the show. I go, what the fuck? Are you serious? <laughs> right. And I, because I had no idea that right. you were going to be there, and then um, you know, got to meet you, and, and it was, it was just, it was a blast, man, to do those shows and to have you on the podcast too. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on Tom Talks. It was so fun. Um, yeah, man. Give it up, Tom Segura. Yeah. Keep us party. Yeah. Party. <laughs>